Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks for sticking around for the last few talks. Uh, we're going to be talking about cluster autoscaling, and in particular, preemptive autoscaling on any cloud. So a quick outline. First, we're going to talk a little bit about us, and then we're going to give an overview of autoscaling in general. And then we're going to talk about cluster autoscaling, sort of do a deep dive, talk a little bit about cloud provider autoscalers, talk quite a bit about the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, which is sort of the core ecosystem project. And then we're going to talk about Cerebral, which is a cluster autoscaler that we built at Containership. Then we'll talk about some future work for the Cerebral project, and then we'll take some questions. About us. So I'm Matt Kelly. I'm a software engineer at Containership. Containership is basically a multi-cloud Kubernetes platform. And my part in that is I do cluster lifecycle management stuff. So that's provisioning, upgrades, the plugin ecosystem, uh, basically controllers, all the Go code, anything running in your cluster when you provision a cluster on Containership. Um, hi, I am Ashley Schuett. I moved to Berlin five days ago and will be working at HelloFresh. Um, but I was previously working on cluster like cycle management, provisioning Kubernetes clusters, and all the things going on running in those clusters. Um, but I'm going to be taking some time and writing, working on some of my open source kubectl plugins. So if you want to check out my GitHub and play with those uh, and make issues, because yeah, I like playing with those. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about auto scaling overview. Um, and just what and why you would want to use auto scaling. And auto scaling is just going to be making your resources meet the demands. There's different types of auto scalers. So whether that means scaling up or down pods or scaling up and down nodes, it's making sure that the resources that you have meet the demands of your current system. Um, why you would want to do this, it's less manual work for your operators, and the less manual work there is, the less chance that there's going to be some kind of mistake. You'll delete something or um, make resources too high for some other thing. Um, and it helps to continually meet the demands of your users without having to intervene. Um, a prerequisite to under, kind of understand how these autoscalers work is to understand resource requests. Um, on pods and deployments, you can specify CPU and memory requests, and that is the allocated amount of CPU or memory that the pod can use. Um, and these refer to allocation, which is different than utilization. In order to get utilization of what is actually being used on those clusters, you would be, need to run a metric server. Um, but in the pod spec, when you're specifying these, this is just the allocation and what needs to be available for the scheduler of Kubernetes to schedule that pod on a node. If there's not enough resources left on the node, the pod can't be scheduled. Um, and like I referenced earlier, there's different types of autoscalers. There's the vertical pod autoscaler, the horizontal pod autoscaler, and the cluster autoscaler. The vertical pod autoscaler is going to be what looks at the pod and what resources are actually being used on it. It's um, something you can deploy on your Kubernetes cluster. And that's along with that vertical pod autoscale, you'll also have to deploy a metric server. And it's going to look at the actual utilization of those pods and either give you recommendations of what the resource requests should be on your pod or update them automatically depending on which mode you're running that VPA in. Um, it's really a convenience tool to make sure that the pods can be scheduled and they are making their allocation requests what is actually needed to run that application. There's also the horizontal pod autoscaler, which again, you need to be running a metric server on your Kubernetes cluster to be able to use this. And again, it'll look at the utilization of these pods. And if they are using all the memory and uh, CPU that's allocated to them, it can scale up the number of pods that are currently in your cluster. So if you're getting a bunch of requests and two pods aren't able to handle the request for your application anymore, it can scale it up to three or four or whatever it needs to, to meet that user demand. And then finally, there's cluster autoscalers. 
Um, and these are, we're gonna go more into a deep dive of them, but a general overview of what a cluster autoscaler is, is going to be looking at the usage of a node and if those nodes are meeting the demands of your users and then it can scale up the node by talking to your cloud provider. And there's multiple different implementations of this, but in general, it's just going to scale up or down the number of nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, cluster autoscalers in particular. Uh, first up is cloud provider autoscalers. So cloud provider autoscalers are the autoscalers that you would get if you were using the autoscaler available on like AWS or Azure or Google or a cloud provider such as that. Um, so they're not Kubernetes aware and they're purely just CPU memory or in some cases custom metric based if that particular cloud platform supports that. Um, the features are highly dependent on which cloud provider you run on. So if you wanna you know, take your system, move it from Azure to Google or Azure to AWS, you might lose some auto-scaling features, you might gain some auto-scaling features, you might need workarounds, things like that. So you're basically locked into the cloud provider that you're using in terms of auto-scaling. So the Kubernetes cluster auto-scaler, um, it's basically an add-on in the core ecosystem. So for example, if you provision a cluster using COPS, I believe you can choose the cluster autoscaler as an add-on within COPS. Um, it's totally Kubernetes-centric, and by that I mean it uses only pure Kubernetes concepts and resources to make autoscaling decisions on. Uh, there's no external data sources. You can't do things like you know, pull metrics from Prometheus and autoscale on that. Um, purely Kubernetes concepts. So just because it's purely Kubernetes concepts doesn't mean that it's a simple um, controller. It's actually pretty complex. So how does it make scaling decisions? Um, the things that trigger scaling when it's scaling up is it will scale when it sees that a pod can't be scheduled. And in fact, it'll only scale up when it sees that a pod can't be scheduled. Not only that, it basically simulates the schedule, scheduler behavior internally, or actually pulls in the scheduler code. Um, and it decides if adding a new node will actually allow the pod to be scheduled. And the reason it does that is it doesn't want to waste any resources. It's only going to scale up if it truly will use that node. Um, for scale down, it's pretty simple. It looks at any nodes that are un underutilized for a configurable amount of time. I think the default is 10 minutes. Um, not only that, it sees if all of the pods running on that node can be safely evicted. In other words, safely rescheduled on a different node. So the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler has this concept of expanders, which is a bit of a misnomer to me, but basically this is how it makes decisions on which node pool to scale up or scale down if you have multiple node pools. Um, so there's a few different methodologies or a few different expanders you can use. The first one's random. It's pretty simple. It chooses a node pool at random to either scale up or scale down. Another one is price. So that's minimizing costs. So say you have a few node pools all running different instance types, you know, um, smaller nodes, bigger nodes, it's gonna scale up the cheapest nodes in that case, or the node pool with the cheapest nodes within it in that case. And there's least waste, so that's when it adds a node, it's trying to determine what node can I add such that I'm gonna minimize the unutilized CPU and memory across the system. And there's also most pods, which is, as it sounds like, the maximum number of pods that can be scheduled on the new node. So what node can I add to maximize the number of pods that could potentially be scheduled? So I already dipped into it a little bit, but there's a few benefits to this approach. Um, again, it's just pure Kubernetes resources and uh, concepts, which is nice because it's easy to understand at a high level but the big overarching benefit is that it's virtually impossible to add a new node to your cluster that's not going to be utilized. And for scale down, it has a lot of safe scale down rules, such as it's not going to scale down a node that's running cube system pods. It's not gonna scale down a node that doesn't have, or that has pods that are labeled as not safe to evict. Um, so it does a lot of checks on scale down. Some downsides is it's just inflexible. It doesn't give the operator any power 
to make the decisions on what to auto scale on. In many cases, the operator may have a lot more info information about how the system works, um, like why you might need to scale up or scale down. In this case, it'll purely schedule or it'll purely scale up if a pod can't be scheduled. And in many cases, if you're waiting that long to schedule a pod, or if you're waiting that long to scale up, a pod is already in a pending state, so you might already be running into issues. Um, so those downsides of the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler is what led us to want to create a different solution for uh, some customers and use cases that we were having, which led to the project Cerebral. Um, and the goals of this project were to address that inflexibility of the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler and give the operator more power to make decisions on metrics like CPU and memory, custom metrics that you can pull in from different databases or an application queue, depending on what they need to look at for the reasons that they might need to be scaling. Um, and as well as we wanted to bring this functionality to any cluster on any cloud provider which currently um, you can't be done with a uh, Kubernetes cluster autoscaler. So a high level architecture of what Cerebral looks like, if we're going from right to left, you're going to be having some autoscaling groups, which is how an operator would group together nodes in their Kubernetes cluster, which doesn't necessarily need to be the same as how they're grouped in the Kubernetes distro that you're using on a cloud provider. And we'll get into more of that later. Um, that we'll be talking to Kubernetes and to the cloud provider, as well as we have an auto scaling engine that talks to the cloud provider to make those decisions on scale up and scale down. Um, in the center of it is the cerebral op operator, which is looking for those auto scaling engines, as well as match metrics backends to be added to the cluster uh, to know how to talk to both the cloud provider and the metrics backend that you choose. Um, and then that metrics backend is what helps interface with whatever metrics provider you're using. Um, so the auto scaling group is a CRD that you would apply to your cluster, and from there you would create an auto scaling CR. Um, the benefit of making these separate auto scaling groups from your cloud provider groups is that you can uh, define them on different constraints, um, whether that's the region or if you're looking at DigitalOcean's Kubernetes provider, looking at their node pool ID and separating those into logical chunks, um, and then attaching the scaling policies that you need to your auto scaling groups. So if you look at an auto scaling group CR in Cerebral, you'll see that um, you can specify that node selector, you can select multiple policies that um, the node selector needs to be looking at and the engine that it should be talking to. Um, there's a suspended field, so whether or not you want it actually auto scaling at this time or not, you can turn it on and off. Um, the cooldown period is for if there is an auto scaling decision made, you want to make sure that there's time for the auto, for the node to actually come up and join the cluster and to kind of wait to make sure there's no thrashing in your cluster. So you can specify a cooldown period before another auto scaling decision would be made, as well as specifying the minimum number of nodes in this pool to the max so you're not spending money on resources that aren't needed or that your business can't afford and making sure that nodes don't go below what your organization wants. Um, and then also specifying the scaling strategy for that auto scaling group. And this is kind of what it looks like if you were to make logical groups on something other than the node pools that you've already specified in your provider. So if you have two node pools in your provider that are in different regions, but they're both GPU, and you want your auto scaling group to scale up when their GPU resources are in high resource, in high usage, but you don't really care what region that this is scaled up in. You can make a different node selector to select all your GPU nodes and then make a decision to just scale up any node pool that would fit that criteria and give you another GPU node. 
So autoscaling policies are pretty straightforward. Um, this is an example autoscaling policy CR. These are what you are attaching to your group to say for this set of nodes, this is the um, this is how I want to make you I, how I want you to make decisions on how to autoscale, basically. Um, so in this example, the metrics backend that we're looking at is just the Kubernetes backend, which is just going to look at CPU percent allocation, um, which is not that dissimilar to how the Kubernetes scheduler works um, at a very high level anyway. So we have a scale up policy, and we're saying that when the percent CPU allocation on that, um, across that entire group of nodes in that logical node pool, breaches the threshold of 70%, then we're going to do a scale up operation. Um, the adjustment type could be percent or absolute. In this case, it's absolute, meaning that we're just going to add the adjustment value of one, one node. The poll interval is how often we pull the metrics backend. Um, so in this case, we're going to pull every 15 seconds. And the sample period is for how long we have to be breaching the threshold that we've set. So in this case, in summary, we're basically saying that if upon polling every 15 seconds, over a period of 600 seconds, we've been above that threshold for that entire period of 600 seconds, only then are we going to make a decision to scale up. So the metrics backend is also, also has a CR associated with it, a custom resource. Um, but it's purely just to register it with Cerebral. So basically it has a name, pretty straightforward, and a configuration, which also ends up being pretty straightforward. That's just how you talk to um, the metrics backend. So for example, in the case of the Kubernetes metrics backend, there is no configuration because you're running in cluster. You know how to talk to Kubernetes. Um, available today, we have Prometheus, InfluxDB, and Kubernetes, which is allocation-based. Um, you can imagine there's a wide range of potential metrics backends. Um, they don't necessarily actually have to be metrics. That's kind of a misnomer for considering renaming. Um, you can imagine, like, it could come from, you could be looking at, like, an application level queue. Just, you're saying, like, when the queue depth reaches 70% or something, scale based on that. So this is this totally pluggable architecture. The way that you would do that is you would just implement this simple interface currently simple interface anyway, um, which just has one function, which is get value. Uh, you provided a, the name of a metric that you want to get. So it could be like queue depth or CPU allocation or you know, anything that your metrics backend understands. You pass it a configuration, and you pass it a node selector. That node selector is just from the autoscaling group, which is telling the metrics backend how to select all the nodes that it's gathering the metrics for. The autoscaling engine is also pretty straightforward, um, like the metrics backend. Also has a CR associated with it just to register it, so name and configuration. Um, today we have available DigitalOcean, AWS, and Containership. Containership uh, itself supports Azure, AWS, DigitalOcean, Packet, and Google. Um, the engine interface is quite simple too. It's a name function, pretty straightforward. And then the set target node count function. Um, where you pass it a number of nodes that you would like to scale to, the strategy that you would like to use for scaling. Currently implemented, we only have random. Um, and then the node selector, which again, is just that node selector from the auto scaling group that's telling it how to select the nodes. So Cerebral, we call them scaling strategies. It's the exact same idea as expanders in the Kubernetes ecosystem for the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler. Um, yeah, same exact thing. Today we only support random, but in the future we hope to implement a lot more uh, scaling strategies. In particular, we'd like to do some things like take inspiration from the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler where they have a pricing API that a cloud provider would implement that tells you how to make decisions on, hey, if I scale this up, then I'm going to minimize costs. Um, pull that out into a common package so that even though it's up to the engine to uh, implement the scaling strategy, you sort of like get help from Core Cerebral. Yeah, so this is an amazing diagram. Um, no demo and no amazing graphs or anything. At the end of the day, so we have 
emojis. Um, on the left is the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, on the right is Cerebral. So we're just going to see how they react to um, just a spike in traffic. So we have a horizontal pod autoscaler. This might be a typical setup, um, which is controlling a deployment. So the horizontal pod autoscaler is going to hit the scale endpoint for the deployment and tell it to scale up based on the CPU or memory utilization of the pods, um, however you have it configured. So this is sort of the base state. You're just like happily chugging along. The HPA is only telling the deployment to have one pod. Serving traffic just fine. So let's say a little while later, you get some more traffic, aka some more car emojis. Um, and now you're at, let's say, like 66% utilization on that node. Um, so in this case, if you have Cerebral configured to, say, scale up at 60%, it's going to see, OK, we are above the threshold that we've um, configured in the autoscaling policy. So now we're going to ask the cloud provider to scale up. In the meantime, Kubernetes cluster autoscaler isn't doing anything because there's no pod in the pending state. So now on the cerebral side, we're starting to bring up a new node to prepare to handle new traffic, um, more traffic. And again, nothing really happening on the left side. So then let's say that a lot more traffic comes in all at once. Um, obviously, there's some time to spin up the new node. So maybe the new node is ready on the cerebral side. Maybe not, but either way, it's been spinning up in the background, um, getting ready to handle the new traffic. So now there's two more pods that need to be placed. Cerebral eventually has no problem placing them. Um, but the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler was able to place one, and then it's reached the capacity of that node. There's another pod that can't be scheduled. Um, so now, finally, the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler sees that and says, oh, OK, I need to scale up. And now it's going to ask the cloud provider to scale up. But the whole point is that there's a pod pending. You already know that you need more pods to service the traffic, and you can't run that pod. So eventually, the node comes up, and then you're happy. Yeah. Um, I think it's also important to note, while well, with this example, we're using the horizontal pod autoscaler to uh, dynamically make the pod scale up. This could be done when you are deploying a new deployment because you have a new application you need to put in your cluster, or you just need to scale up an application you already have manually. Um, this does, it doesn't matter if it's like if pods are being placed by the horizontal pod autoscaler or not. Um, it can just be because more pods are being added to your cluster. Um, but some benefits and downsides of Cerebral. Um, the benefits are what our goals were. It was to give the operator more power. You have more information that you can make decisions on for auto scaling, as well as adding more. Um, flexibility around your auto scaling groups and the things you can make decisions on and the way you partition the nodes to make those decisions on. Um, however, th that doesn't come without some downsides. Um, you might scale up a node that's never used. It scales up preemptively before you actually need those resources. So it might scale up, you might never use that node and you might have spent money on resources you didn't actually need. As well as when scaling down there's currently not checks in place to uh, scale down safely. So that is something we are want to work on, and we have um, some issues in place to uh, get that work done. So how do you get started with Cerebral? It's open source. There's Git repo right there, um, containership slash Cerebral. Um, but there's a bunch of example manifests for a bunch of different, like there's a whole matrix of configuration, right? So you could have the Kubernetes backend um, running against a COPS cluster, for example, or any combination of things. So we have a bunch of examples there. They're pretty easy to plug in and get going. Um, also, in lieu of a demo, we have this detailed walkthrough blog that I think we posted just now. If not, it's going to be available in a second. Um, it basically just walks through using the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler on a COPS cluster, and then uh, doing the exact same experiment with an HPA um, triggering scale up stuff, but using Cerebral on that same COPS cluster. So it's trying to do sort of like an apples to apples comparison so you can see the pros and cons of each approach. And it really depends on your business needs, which one you're going to need. Yep. Um, so 
the project's current status is it's an alpha state. The core functionality is there. It is usable. It is workable. Um, however, we want more feedback from the community. We want more issues um, so that we can change interfaces, CRDs, and those kind of things um, before putting it in beta state and making it more stable. Um, so some of the future work that we uh, have planned and want to work on is supporting the cluster API as a scaling engine. Um, cluster API, for those who aren't familiar, is a way to make your infrastructure in a declarative state, just like your deployments and your applications, so that once you define the state of your infrastructure, um, you can be confident that it's always in that state, and there's the control loop to back it, just like there would be for your pods and services and applications. As well as we want to move those metric backends and the scaling engine out of tree so they wouldn't be defined by CRDs and they wouldn't be something that's synced into Cerebral. It'd be something that could talk over a gRPC server. Um, as well as uh, I think we think it's very really important to add those scaling strategies. So to make it safer on scale down as well as adding more ways to scale up and adding more of the expanders that are in Kubernetes cluster autoscaler. Questions? Yeah. yeah. I was wondering what you mentioned about um, being able to uh, scale in different ranges. Do you have to have your, your cluster span in different ranges? So, how do you manage the different horizontal bottom scalers to combine your all with the regular Um. So, I think the question is how do you? Handle the interaction between the HPA, the horizontal pod autoscaler, and the cluster autoscaler? Uh, multiple regions. Mm -hmm. This is just a single cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah? Um, so for distros, oh, sorry, um, how do you, oh, wow, it's hard to repeat questions. Um. <laughs> the gist of it is, are there any requirements that the cloud provider must uh, match in order for us to be able to implement um, an engine or a, yeah. Okay, uh, so the question was how, or, wow. Um, is there any specifics that a cloud provider has to have in order for an auto-scaling engine, auto -scaling engine to be implemented in work? Um, so no, there isn't. Currently, it is easiest if you're using something like DigitalOcean or AWS that has predefined notions of a cloud group because you can just scale that to the number that's associated with it. But you don't have to. You could make a cluster with kubectl, and then your, your engine would just have to be smarter, and you would have to... Um, make another query to the provider to know how to exactly you want it to scale those nodes. Um, but that would just be an implementation in the engine. So you can basically keep the state um, of the, uh, for example, the state of the auto scaling group um, in memory, inside memory of the uh, uh, cerebral because uh, there is no such state at the cloud provider except for the number of running instances, just the running instances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your implementation would probably have to add some kind of well-known label to your node. So across nodes, you could kind of have them separated and know uh, which type you wanted to scale and be able to group them that way. So I guess you have to have labels, but as long as you have that, then this mm -hmm. is maybe the only requirement. Yeah, you would need some kind of label to keep things sorted. I think it's worth noting that the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, I believe, requires that the cloud provider has a notion of autoscaling groups, whereas we're not requiring that with Cerebral. Again, it is just a label. It's mm -hmm. like the way DigitalOcean works, um, which she implemented. Do you want to yeah, so uh, with AWS, they have the autoscaling groups. So that is, your min and max nodes need to kind of match those auto scaling groups, but for an engine like DigitalOcean, while you have those separate concepts of node pools, there's no auto scaling engine on that. 
Um, so it gives you those labels already, which makes it easier to make those scaling decisions, but that's just because DigitalOcean already added that, where you could add it yourself if you wanted to for a different engine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, does it support scaling on multiple metrics? And the simple answer is yes. Um, you can attach multiple policies to one auto-scaling group. So you could have like a memory policy and a CPU policy. I don't actually know that that's the best practice, but you can imagine uh, maybe you have a CPU policy or like you have a different policy that looks at a custom metrics backend that's looking at like the depth of a queue or something. So you have some more like generic CPU thing, but you also have your application specific thing. You can attach that to the same it, um, pool. Yeah, and it also depends. You could write custom metrics that however you, whatever metrics you need to get from Prometheus or InfluxDB, and you can make scaling decisions off those. Oh, sorry, there was someone in the back who's been waiting a bit. Um, so the question is, why did we decide to implement our own autoscaler, Cerebral, instead of using Kubernetes cluster autoscaler? Um. Uh, well, so basically, <laughs> we think that the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler is just inflexible, and it's really, truly designed to only scale if a pod can't be scheduled. And there's definitely good arguments for that. I mean, their argument is that you shouldn't use CPU or memory-based autoscalers with Kubernetes. Um, so I don't think that they're going to be supportive of that sort of thing being added to it. Um, but we've had feedback that it's still useful to be able to scale on any metric that you choose. Because again, in many cases, you as the operator of the system, you know more about your system than Kubernetes possibly can. So we think it is useful to be able to scale on custom metrics, so like queue depth or things like that. Yeah? Uh, I guess my question is actually, um, you could achieve the same by using the well, not the pod auto scaler, but the pod which in turn triggers the cluster auto scaler, right? And the horizontal pod auto scaler can use custom metrics already. So wouldn't that sort of achieve the same? Um, yeah. So with that, you would still have to wait for a pending pod to be able to make that scaling decision. So even though you can use those custom metrics to horizontally scale those pods, you're still waiting for that pod to be in a pending state. They do have the workaround to pad your pods um, so you can have things with a lower weighted priority. And then um, those would get kicked off and you'd schedule an important node. And so you would be in sync, but that adds a workaround. It adds extra complexity to your manifests, and it wasn't something we found desirable. Did you still? Yeah, I had a question, which is uh, actually a question following previous uh, regarding multiple uh, policies. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to configure the multiple policies with N and or logic, or how it works? Like if all the policies are uh, applied, or So yeah, the question is, is it possible to um, basically configure it such that you could take the logical and of multiple policies versus just the logical or? And the short answer is no. Today, it's, uh, you can assign multiple policies, or you can attach multiple policies to an autoscaling group, but we only take the logical or of them. Certainly something that we would consider if you open an issue. Or a pull <laughs> request. Um. All right. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot.